So people seem to like my video from last summer titled Let's Make a Pokemon Game, where we designed a hypothetical new Pokemon game by shaking up the series formula without changing its core concepts. I've gotten a lot of requests for my take on other franchises, so today I've decided to talk about what I would like to see from an Animal Crossing game, just before New Horizons comes out, because if I make those suggestions after it comes out and the game actually has them, then this video will look stupid. Uh, you might notice the tone of this video is a little different from the Pokemon one. That's because I think Pokemon's main problem is a lack of innovation, whereas Animal Crossing's main problem is basic quality of life issues and a lack of innovation. So the Pokemon video was more of a creative pitch, and this one's more of a mechanical pitch with some creative stuff sprinkled on top. And we wouldn't have been able to make this pitch at all without the help of our friends at Monster Legends, who sponsored this video. Uh, just like with the Pokemon video, we wanted nice custom artwork and specific footage to work with, and none of that would have been possible without their help. Monster Legends is a free game for iOS and Android that you can download right now by clicking the link in the description. I started playing it a while back, which means I've obviously collected a ton of monsters, including, of course, the most important monster, Hackster, a hamster who is also a hacker. You can evolve your monsters by feeding them the most classic and well-loved of all monster foods, tomatoes, which then allows them to catch up to stronger monsters so they can dominate in the PvP modes like League and Arena. Or you can face off against your friends over Facebook Connect, which means that if your friend makes a dumb post, but you can't quite chuck a tomato at them because they live too far away, now you can do the next best thing, chuck a monster at them, a monster filled with tomatoes. You can also breed your monsters to get new species and grow your collection. For those of you who have already already played Monster Legends, I don't need to tell you how cool this game is. Well, keep an eye out because Monster Legends recently launched the Legends Pass, which allows you to obtain rewards and privileges that no one else has, like a highly anticipated hatching boost. Also, be sure to be on the lookout for new monster skins, which allow you to customize your monsters more than ever before. Once again, Monster Legends is absolutely free and you can download it right now by clicking the link in the description below. Okay, back to Animal Crossing. So, for those who don't know what Animal Crossing is, but still decided to click on this video out of politeness, thank you, Animal Crossing is a life sim game where you hang out with your animal neighbors and basically do nothing. It manages to be fun somehow. Uh, I have a weird relationship with Animal Crossing. The original Animal Crossing for GameCube is one of my all-time most played games ever, and even though I don't think it holds up anymore, I would still consider it to be one of my favorite games. Later on, I played Wild World for the DS a little and didn't really like it, and then I played City Folk for the Wii a lot and didn't like it at all. And around the time New Leaf came out, I decided to spend my winter break home from college doing something I was never able to do as a kid, trying to beat the original Animal Crossing. Of course, you can't beat Animal Crossing. There's no ending. But as a kid, I always saw Animal Crossing as a collecting things game. There's a museum with 40 bugs, fish, paintings, and fossils to fill up. Uh, and on top of that, you have your debt to pay off. I spent two weeks fast forwarding through an entire in-game year. And then at the end of my break, I had, quote, completed the game. Except for the paintings, which I took a mulligan on because paintings are horseshit and entirely luck-based, uh, so I just didn't do them. That playthrough scratched my Animal Crossing itch for a long time, so I didn't end up playing New Leaf until a few years later just to study up for my So This Is Basically Animal Crossing video. I was really excited to try it because everybody I know who played it when it came out seemed really, really into it. They liked it a lot. But to my surprise, not only did I not like it, but it felt like I was playing the exact same game that came out in 2001. Same structure, same museum, same town, same fishing, same everything. The only new element was the town management, which at the end of the day amounts to little more than additional debts for you to pay off if you want to unlock the new buildings. Most of the fan comics I saw online about the game at the time were making fun of the same thing. Villagers moving into your town and putting their houses in inconvenient locations without your consent. I figured this gag was so prevalent because this feature was really annoying, but it turned Turns out the reason everyone kept making the same joke was because it was about the only new thing they added to the game. Now, okay, I'm not saying that New Leaf doesn't bring anything to the table, but I am saying that if you gave me 11 years to improve the original Animal Crossing, I sure as hell wouldn't have come up with Animal Crossing New Leaf. So, what would I have come up with? Well, like I said in the Pokemon video, when you're designing something, you should have a goal in mind that you're designing towards. What is an Animal Crossing game trying to accomplish? Unlike with Pokemon, Animal Crossing isn't a specific one-to-one -one experience that every single player will have, which makes it a little trickier to design. It has no beginning, no end, no story, and a player is pretty much allowed to do whatever they want. That means that instead of creating a specific game structure, I'm going to try and make a game that's catered to the three main types of players who play Animal Crossing. Crossing, according to me. 
The first group are the collectors. These are people like me who see the empty shelves in the museum and immediately book it out into the world to try and discover everything the game has to offer so we can fill that empty space. If you're the kind of player who spends most of your Stardew Valley run filling up the community center, or if your immediate goal in the game is side quests and exploration, you're probably a collector. The second group are the recliners. These are the players who use life sim games as a way to mellow out and relax at the end of the day. Video games are escapism, and popping open your 3DS to fish for an hour or two just for the fun of it is a nice way to spend an afternoon. The final group are the stylists. These are people who will spend all their time and money making their characters in town look cute as heck because appearance is important and it's fun. This is the kind of player who cheat codes themselves a bunch of money in The Sims and then uses it to build their ideal mega mansion, then immediately stops playing the second their sim moves in because as far as they are concerned, the game is over. Most people who enjoy Animal Crossing probably fall somewhere on this triangle between the three types. There's a variety of play styles here, and I think that each Animal Crossing game caters to a different one. The first game mostly leaned towards collectors and recliners, with very little for stylists to play with besides their own house and clothing. Every game since then has slowly moved more and more towards the recliner stylist corner. The games have become much laxer, and they've added a lot more options for customization, but there's barely anything new to experience, with only eight new bugs and fish being added to each successive version of the game, and a museum that's barely changed since its inception. If you collected everything in the first Animal Crossing game, you've pretty much done it in all of them. My goal here is to design a game catered to all three of these play styles simultaneously. Let's call this new game Animal Crossroads. Our goal with Crossroads is to create a game that is relaxing and comfortable, offers a good amount of customization, has solid quality of life improvements, and adds a lot to collect and explore beyond the current Animal Crossing franchise. Okay, let's begin. First things first, you're still the mayor. Making the player the mayor was a really good idea for gameplay innovation, but New Leaf didn't really do anything with it, so we're gonna fix that. You also get to choose your appearance from the start of the game. No more of this train hobo personality quiz nonsense. This isn't Pokemon Mystery Dungeon. I wanna know what I look like. Second, your town is structured a little differently from before. Both City Folk and New Leaf have the town that you live in and the city where you do your shopping as separate areas. I realize this is probably because the Wii has the processing power of an egg timer and can't really handle more than four things on screen at once, but it's also very annoying. This means that every time you want to buy an item from the city, you need to pass through at least four loading zones to do it. I know that doesn't seem like much, but in a game about doing the same thing hundreds of times over and over again, small inconveniences stack up pretty quick. I'm gonna come back to that later, by the way. Put a pin in that for now. It's a huge quality of life problem. So instead of having the village and city as separate areas, we're going to combine them into one place. This is your town. It's nice, and it's also yours. That means you get to decide how it looks from the get-go. That includes the rivers, bridges, villager houses, shops, you name it. You even get to pick out one or two specific villagers of your choice to move in with you at the start of the game. That way you can keep your favorites even if you have to restart your file. There will be a full-on village creation mode. No more that clunky Isabel follows you around and you manually tell her where you wanna build stuff nonsense. Who came up with that idea, by the way? Whenever you unlock a new shop, you get to decide where to put it, and you can move them at any time Time, anywhere. Within reason, of course. You can't just chuck the coffee shop into a river. Uh, you can also relocate the buildings anytime you want after building them, free of charge. That way, players who want to change their town layout don't have to pay a zillion bells because one of the shops doesn't really gel with their new aesthetic. This allows players to customize their town however they like. If you want to make your town a seaside resort with a bunch of shops right next to the beach, hey, you can do that. Maybe you're a pragmatist who just wants to throw all the shops right next to your house for ease of access. Hey, you can do that too. This town is yours to to customize. Normally when you unlock a new building or pay off your debt, you have to wait a day for the building to be upgraded, during which time you can't shop there at all. I've always found this feature to be really annoying, uh, so instead of that, we're going to have upgrades be instant. You hand the Nooklings their bells, some carpenter woodpeckers walk up, the shop is remodeled in a poof of cartoon smoke, and boom, your new store is ready to go. You can walk in and shop immediately. There is no reason to make a player wait to access the reward they've already earned. Locking off a store for renovations isn't a reward, it's a punishment. New Leaf is full of unnecessary wait times like this. For instance, in order to build things as the mayor, you know, the main mechanic of New Leaf, the player needs to raise their approval rating to 100% by doing tasks around town. Once they do, Isabel puts in the application for the development permit, and the player is forced to wait a day before they can do anything. Why? What is the reasoning for this? The game seems to understand that Animal Crossing is a time-based series where things are supposed to revolve around the clock, but it doesn't seem to understand why. The original Animal Animal Crossing was a decidedly solo experience, where everything was dictated by the clock. The game would play itself whether you were there or not. 
That was the gimmick. The clock was the game. If you tried to cheat the clock, the game would punish you. Resetting would summon an angry mole who would yell at you. Not playing for a month meant a town of villagers guilt tripping you for abandoning them. If you didn't save correctly while visiting a friend's town, the game would rip out your eyeballs. And I'm not saying these mechanics were fun. I'm not even saying they were good. And I would never recommend Animal Crossing for the GameCube to anybody in 2020. But, all of those time-based design choices fed back into the game's central mechanic of the clock. They all served a purpose, and they were all there for a reason. Except for having to mail your fossils to the faraway museum, fuck that. Modern Animal Crossing is not that game anymore. It's no longer one player dancing around a clock. It's multiple players designing towns, living lives, sharing them with each other, and enjoying their time together in a casual, brightly colored world. But for some reason, the wait times from the original game are still there. They've been grandfathered in because, well, that's how Animal Crossing's supposed to be. I mess with tradition. But the clock and its artificial wait times aren't part of the game design anymore. They don't contribute to anything. They're fossils, relics that get in the way of fun. If I'm ordering furniture I've already owned to decorate my house, why do I have to wait 24 hours of real time for that furniture to arrive? If I've done everything there is to do in town on a given day, why do I have to turn the game off and click through five menus before I can change the clock forward to tomorrow? Why are you making it hard for me to play more of your game? This isn't some pay-to-play gotcha or a predatory MMO where you need to trick the players into wasting real-world money if they don't want to wait to play more of your game. This is a video game they own. They bought it from you. Let them play it. In a game all about relaxation and customization, there is no reason to put menus and wait times between your player and their goal. Waiting isn't fun. Any mechanic that makes a player play less of your game is a bad mechanic. So, we're getting rid of the clock. Now, that doesn't mean we're cutting out the time mechanic entirely. It's too central to the game. We're just changing how it works a little bit. Normally, if you want to advance to the next day, you have to save, quit, go into the options menu, manually set the time forwards, and start the game again. This is affectionately nicknamed time travel. It is extremely useful for passing time and also extremely annoying because it takes several minutes of menuing and load screens every time you want to do it. Now, I know that time traveling is a little controversial in the Animal Crossing community, and some players say you shouldn't be able to do it at all. Those players are wrong, because if I have six hours of free time to play a video game today and zero hours the next four days, and this game punishes me for not playing it every single day, I would like to play it now, thanks. I own it. So, instead of all that nonsense, Crossroads offers two methods of advancing time in-game. First, you can just hop in your bed and take a nap, Harvest Moon or Stardew Valley style, immediately advancing to any time you want the next day. This way, when you've finished all there is to do on any given day, you can just keep playing your video game without having to wait. You even get to pick the specific time when you want to wake up, so you can catch some early morning bugs at 7 a.m., or you can sleep in until the evening to check out the next day's fireworks show. Going to bed only advances time forward up to 24 hours. But say you want to travel a little further. Maybe you want to move forward a week or go backwards because you missed Halloween. Well, never fear. We've got a brand new NPC to help you out. A sleepy magic dragon on a pile of rocks in town square named Winkle. Now, this guy's been here forever, and if you wake him up, he's more than happy to magically transport you to any time in the past or future. How? Magic! Who cares? This way you can quickly zip around the calendar without all the hassle of restarting the game. Another big downside to Animal Crossing is that it punishes you if you want to stop playing it for a while, which means that picking up old files is really cumbersome. To combat that, we're giving the player the ability to stop time altogether. Time only flows when Winkle is asleep, so if you know you're not going to pick the game up again for a while, like if you're going on vacation or something, then you can wake him up and presto, you've paused time. This also allows stylist players to keep their town in a certain aesthetic for as long as they like. This could be a beach town in perpetual summer, a cherry blossom town that's always spring, or maybe just a Halloween town that's always on October 31st. But there's still a problem. If you're a collector player who wants to focus on getting all the bugs or fish, it doesn't matter how accessible we make time travel. You still need to do lots of calendar hopping if you want to fill out that museum without waiting. And that means lots of menuing and missing out on any of the holiday events. So we're adding one more major new element to our game. In most of the Animal Crossing games, there's an area called the island. No matter what time of the year you visit the island, it will always be summer. You can catch any summer bugs and fish there, as well as a few creatures that are entirely unique to the island itself. 
Having a season-locked area is nice because you always have access to bugs and fish of a certain variety, plus it's a good way to make money by catching and selling them. So we're going to add three new seasonal zones, the Autumn Valley, the Winter Resort, and the Vernal Marsh. These zones work like the island in New Leaf, but they're quite a bit larger, ideally around two to four times the size to allow for some ecological diversity as well as for some new buildings. Each zone has its own unique group of animals along with their own shop, like the Kappas on the island. The players can sell any items they find in these areas to the shop at full price without having to return to the town proper, an extremely time-consuming downside of visiting the island for money in New Leaf. Each of these new seasonal zones will have their own specialties. The Autumn Valley is a farmland in a perpetual harvest managed by a family of crows. They allow the player to plant their own garden in their fertile soil, which grows flowers faster than they would normally grow in the town with an increased chance of hybrids. The Vernal Marsh is a mangrove swamp covered in a thick, spooky fog. This doubles as a tropical wet season area and is teeming with unique bugs. For some reason, I'm really set on the caretakers being catfish. I know that's a little messed up since you can also catch catfish in these games, but eh, there's frog and octopus villagers and you seem to be fine selling their cousins off to the nooklings for blood bells. So like whatever. The Winter Resort is a ski retreat up in the snowy mountains. Winter doesn't have a lot of bugs or fish to offer, but since this is a pretty upscale resort, I'm thinking it's got to focus on furniture. The caretakers are reindeer who work for Jingle, Animal Crossing's resident Santaman, and they make furniture during their off season. We could also put some sort of paleontological dig site there for fossils. With the island, now the Summer Island, rounding out the group, we now have permanent access to all four seasons, while time continues to advance as normal in the main town. This means the town can stay dedicated to holiday events and character customization, while the other four seasonal areas exist for collectible hunting and making money. And now that there are new areas, probably separated by loading zones, I wouldn't mind adding a little fast travel system that instantly lets you pop from one to the other, just to save a little more time. Infinite time with any given season means that we don't have to worry about missing any bugs or fish that might appear during a given month. We always have access to them. This in turn means that we're actually allowed to have a little more fun when hiding how they spawn. As it stands, about 90% of the critters in Animal Crossing have a random chance of spawning in the overworld based on time of day and general rarity. Beyond that, there's not much to it. You just walk around and hope that a specific critter appears. The most fun bugs have always been the ones that utilize their environment. Beehives hidden in the trees, dung beetles rolling snowballs, moths flying around lanterns that you've built outside of buildings. It's so much more fun to find out that you can catch ants by leaving a piece of candy or an old turnip on the ground than it is to just wander around and hope that the dragonfly you're looking for appears. I want the bugs to interact with their environments in more specific ways. I want to change it so it's less about when you can find a specific bug or fish and more about how you find a specific bug or fish. Fishing is especially bad about this. Your only indication of a fish is an amorphous black shadow and you have to catch it if you want to find out what it is. This means you might have to go through a hundred million crucian carp before you can find that angel fish you're looking for. I find this especially weird because the game already has the models for these fish made. You see them when you donate to the museum. Just take those models, darken them a little, show them from above, and have them semi-visible under the water. You can even keep different species of fish shadowed until you've caught them for yourself the first time. That way you always know which one is a new fish and you should always go for a fish that's already covered in shadow. There's nothing fun about casting your line, crossing your fingers, and hoping RNG is on your side this time with no real input on your end. While we're on the subject, I think the fishing mini game, if you even want to call it that, needs a little bit of work. Like, I think we can do a little better than press A when the controller shakes. I'm I'm able to fish for two hours straight in Stardew Valley without ever getting bored. But in Animal Crossing, I'm zoning out after like three casts and I kind of want to stop. I don't have a specific suggestion for this, but I'm not against just straight up stealing Stardew Valley's secondary rewards mechanic. It just gives a little more variety while you're fishing and it's nice to make some extra bells on the side. Maybe there's some aquatic furniture that you can only fish up out of the water. Just little stuff like that. It's a little, but it helps. Also, no more trash. I'm sick of catching trash. It's a waste of an inventory slot. Unless you're gonna reward me for fishing up trash by upgrading some kind of town beauty mechanic, I don't wanna be catching cans, okay? If you have to have trash, then I don't know, bring back the town dump and add a possum NPC who enjoys collecting trash that you fish out of the river. And if you give him enough garbage, he'll upgrade your fishing rods so fish will turn towards the bobber even if it misses them. This way, trash becomes a valuable reward that builds to an upgrade instead of a punishment because haha, you 
decided to fish. F you! Here's a tire! Speaking of collectibles, the museum itself needs some tweaking. The original museum had bugs, fish, fossils, and paintings, and that hasn't changed for 20 years! Sure, New Leaf added deep sea creatures, but that's basically just fishing with extra steps, and personally, I didn't find it much fun. Honestly, given the choice, I would cut the diving mechanics and also cut fine art, because that's just based on luck and it's not fun to do. But, in their place, I would add a long overdue new wing of the museum, the greenhouse, where players can donate different plants. I'm actually pretty surprised the series hasn't added a botany collection yet. Gardening's one of the only mechanics they've been consistently developing from game to game. New Leaf even has a shop for it now. The botany collection lets you collect plant life and submit it to the museum. This includes flowers, fruits, mushrooms, and even the different kinds of unique weeds that can spawn in your town, like four-leaf clovers and rafflesia. Because there are now so many different seasonal areas to explore, there's plenty of unique plants for the player to find. You can get glowing mushrooms in the Vernal Marsh, or frost flowers exclusive to the winter resort. The Autumn Valley specializes in botany as a whole, and the farmers that live there can give you tips on how to literally grow your collection. Many of the plants have special blooming conditions, so some only appear at night, others only bloom if certain bugs are there to pollinate them, and aquatic plants like lily pads can only be caught with the fishing rod or by slapping your net into a pond. Once a player has submitted an item to the greenhouse, they can receive a cutting of that plant anytime they want for a small fee, allowing the player to grow as many of that plant as they like in their main town. This encourages players to share the things they've already found with others, and allows them to easily decorate their towns however they like. Now that we have the basic structure of the town done, we can start to talk about gameplay changes. Animal Crossing has this nasty habit of everything being hidden behind a paywall. Literally everything in the game at some point passes through the bottleneck of bells. You have to pay money to upgrade your house, your town, wear clothes, change your hair, decorate. Literally everything is done through bells. I draw a gameplay flowchart out, but when you boil things down, Animal Crossing basically looks like this and the gameplay loop is shaped like a giant coin, and the only step is money, which is boring. There are a small number of shop upgrades that unlock via other means, such as Leaf's Gardening Shop, which opens after you've performed a number of gardening tasks, but this is the exception rather than the rule. And beyond that, everything is locked off behind either price tags or wait times. You need to spend X number of bells at the Nookling store and wait Y number of days since your previous renovation before you can upgrade again. As the mayor in New Leaf, you get to decide which of the public works projects your town builds next, but you have to get the funding for it first, and aside from the villagers chipping in the occasional gumball, you're gonna be the only one donating. So, in our game, we are changing how being the mayor works. Instead of a seemingly endless stream of money that you need to do anything, town upgrades can now be unlocked through the completion of special quests called mayor tasks. A mayor task could be anything from fishing up a lost item out of a river to gathering ingredients so that Katarina can repair her crystal ball and start more accurate fortune telling. These tasks don't need to be very complicated, they just need to be unique enough to keep the player engaged while not making them spend an endless amount of bells. Ideally, the requirement for triggering a mayor task to unlock and getting its subsequent shop upgrade should happen naturally if the player is frequently engaging with the relevant store. So say you want to upgrade your gardening shop. Donating plants to the museum and keeping your town beautiful are good thresholds for that, because if the player's already buying a lot of flowers and bushes from the store, it's likely they're working towards those goals anyway, and the upgrade will naturally help them do that. Let's keep using the gardening shop as the example. So, say you need to plant 30 flowers in order to initiate an upgrade sequence. Once the upgrade is available, Isabel will assign you a mayor task relevant to the shop at hand. This task is for the gardening shop, so let's say that Leaf wants to expand his stock by collaborating with the crow farmers from the Autumn Valley. The crows agree to do this if the mayor helps them deal with a swarm of locusts currently ravaging their farm. The player's task is to use their bug net to catch a certain number of locusts in a set amount of time. Once the player clears the minigame, the task is complete. The crows begin shipping their seeds to town and Leaf Shop will upgrade. These tasks add some much needed diversity to the gameplay and make the town and its inhabitants feel alive beyond just their interactions with the player character. To be honest, I think Animal Crossing has done a terrible job with this. New Leaf has over 300 different villagers, but it only has eight personalities between that 300. And even those eight are really just the same four male personalities and their female equivalents. Villagers are little more than window dressing at this point. Colorful figures who amble around your town like zombies that haven't had an interesting thought since 2004. Now, I'm not asking for the villagers to be as intricate as, say, Harvest Moon or Stardew Valley characters. We don't need to be able to, like, marry them or anything like that. As much as we might want to. 
but still, a little more variety would go such a long way. In every game except for Wild World, you can have more than eight villagers in your town, and that means you have a 100% chance of having at least two identical villagers with the exact same personality. Just upping that number to even 12 personality types would make such an enormous difference. I would also suggest giving each personality type a specific set of town upgrades that they'll actively help you build. So, say for example that you want to build a hammock, and that takes a specific number of bells or items before you can actually do it. But, if you have a bunch of lazy villagers in your town, they also want to see the hammock made. So they will chip in a bunch of money and significantly reduce the amount you have to pay yourself. That way, even if the localization is a little lacking and their personalities aren't that interesting, at least they'll be useful mechanically. Whenever I get this feeling that the villagers are more watered down now, I always think like, ah, you know what, that's probably just nostalgia talking. I bet they weren't actually that good in Wild World in the original GameCube game. But then, no, I look it up and they were way more interesting. They had way more spice to them in all their dialogue. Sure, the original Animal Crossing was mean, but at least mean is a personality. It's better than talking to a graham cracker. I don't know if this is the localization or what, but lord, the characters are just nothing. There's even less excuse for the NPC shopkeepers to be as boring as they are. These aren't like the villagers. These guys are mandatory. The developers know exactly how they're going to interact with a player in any given game, yet they seem flatter with each installation of the series. Blathers, for instance, has a ton of personality in the first two games, offering unique insight on about half of the game's different collectible items, most notably on the bugs, which he hates so much. If you give him a bug, he will describe the different and unique way he hates each one. But in New Leaf, if you hand him an item, he's just like, Oh cool, thanks, back to standing here forever. Ah, a bug. I do not like that. Blink, blink. Like, if you're just gonna cut his personality, why even keep him around, honestly? You might as well just replace him with an inanimate donation box or a signpost and save us the trouble. Some of the shopkeepers actually do have some hidden depth if you talk to them repeatedly, most notably the Abel sisters in each game, but again, these are the exceptions rather than the rule. So give each shopkeeper and NPC at least two unique interactions outside of their own storefront. Have them wander town or the seasonal zones after their store hours close, or maybe on certain holidays. Have different shopkeepers talk to each other at night over coffee. Trigger special hidden events and unlock mayor tasks by chatting with them at the right time of day or by coming into their store with a certain item in your pocket. Hey, if you really want to keep the fine art section around and make it more interesting, then maybe a good way to do that is to have each NPC character own a different piece they can donate, but only after you've completed their specific mayor task. So the collection is less about how lucky you are when it comes to finding paintings, and more about how good you are at sussing out the secret cutscenes with each NPC. Just anything to spice things up. Isabelle and Nook especially should have like five hidden events each, bare minimum. I live with these characters every day. I want to be interested in them. I want to like them as people. And look, I'm not looking for prize winning writing or anything here, but if you can fit every line of dialogue your character says on like a single sheet of paper, then I think you failed. Okay, so we've covered all the major changes to gameplay. Now it's time to go through and tweak all the little annoying things and do the quality of life fixes. And this is Animal Crossing, so there are a lot of those. First of all, inventory space, more of it. Why am I constantly running out of room in my pockets? I should be able to carry three times this much. If I want to relax while fishing, I shouldn't have to sprint back and forth to the store every five minutes because my pants are full of carp. You can't even fish anymore until you throw some of the fish back in the river, throw some items on the ground, or toss your tools in your mail slots because yeah that's a really elegant solution and while we're on the subject tools lots of changes with tools tools like the shovel axe bug net and fishing rod should be available immediately on the first or second day of the game at absolute latest nothing is more annoying than watching bugs fly around your town and being unable to interact with them for two weeks because the nooklings refuse to get a bug net in stock what's more tools should not take up inventory space at all they should be held in unique slots available for quick select at any time. Let's compare this to another game, Stardew Valley. In a game like Stardew Valley, managing inventory space is part of the design philosophy. You only have a few real-world minutes to play any in-game day, and you can only carry so much at a time, so deciding what you do and don't bring with you into the mines or out into the farm is part of the game. If you don't bring the right tools, you might get trapped or defeated by monsters, but if you bring all your tools, then you can't hold as much treasure
treasure or harvest as many crops, and time is a precious commodity. Inventory management is part of the challenge. Animal Crossing is not like that. You have infinite time in Animal Crossing, and you always want to be carrying all of your tools, because if a rare item floats by in a balloon and you don't have your slingshot, then you're screwed. Carrying all your tools takes up a third of your inventory, which is insane. And yeah, you can always drop stuff on the ground and pick it up later because there's infinite time, but there's infinite time. So why are you punishing me by removing a third of my inventory when I'm just using the basic tools of your game? You should be able to stack up to nine like items in any given slot, but for some reason you can only do this with food, and even then it's kind of a pain. Like, it doesn't auto stack. You have to do that yourself after picking it up. You can also stack bells in your inventory, but only if they're the same denomination. So a 100 bell coin does not stack with a 1000 bell bag. Which, speaking of, why can I even hold bells in my inventory in the first place? If I pick up bells, they go into an item slot where you have to open the menu and manually drag them to your wallet. Why don't they just go directly into my wallet? Why would I ever want them to take up an item slot? Better question, why am I only able to hold 99,999 bells? There is literally no reason in any video game ever to limit your wallet size, but for some reason Animal Crossing does. Why? You know how many bells I should be able to carry? Literally 1,000 times this many. Animal Crossing's quality of life is so bad. It's so bad. It's like nobody quality tested these games before they released them. Example, say you have about 200,000 bells you need to pay off for your mortgage. If you want to pay off your debt, then you need to go deposit those bells into the ATM. But even if you have way more bells than that already in your bank account, you cannot deposit those bells directly to pay off your debt. You have to withdraw the bells and put them into your inventory so that you can put the bells back into the machine you just took them out of through a different option. However, 200,000 bells is more than you can hold in your wallet, which means you need to have at least two bags of money separate from your wallet to pay off your loan. And that means you need at least two open inventory slots to hold those extra bells. And if you don't currently have the inventory space, then you're gonna have to go back outside and drop something and go back in to withdraw the money each time. Oh man, if only there was some kind of machine that let me hold a lot of money and deposit directly to different sources. And this is everywhere throughout the game, it's constant. If you wanna make money by selling fish on the island in New Leaf, here are the steps you need to take. Manually deposit all of your items into a box, including all of your personal tools. Sail to the island. Re-rent all of those tools that you want from the islanders. Go outside. Catch as many fish as you can carry, which isn't that many. Go inside. Deposit the fish in the box. Repeat three times. Return all the items you rented to the lady. Leave the island. Take your spoils out of the box in three separate trips. Run to the store. Go back. Run to the store. Go back. Run to the store. Then repeat the process over and over over again. You know what might be faster? Maybe just let me sell things at full price on the island! Heck, let's cut out the middleman entirely. Use your Nook phone to call a Nook drone down from Nookmazon Prime and sell your items immediately. Make things expedient. Even basic interactions with Isabel have poor click economy. She only has three options per menu and a next button, so basic interaction with her can take up to five or six button presses to get what you want. Plus, half her options are only available when you stand in front of her, and the other half are only available at your desk because they ran out of space in her menu, so they had to give her more menus! Menu, 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 it's so badly designed! Animal Crossing is a 15-hour game disguising itself as a 60-hour game because everything you do takes four times as long as it should! But doing things that are boring and take a long time is more realistic. Oh yeah? So is the inevitability of death, Karen! That doesn't mean I want it in my Animal Crossing game! Thank you guys so much for watching. A huge thank you to Monster Legends for sponsoring this video. Again, the link to their game is down in the description. Thank you to all of the fabulous backers we have over on Patreon. Uh, we would not have been able to make this video without their help. If you like listening to me talk at you and say ideas at you for upwards of 40 minutes, Boy, is Patreon a good place to go for that, because there's a lot of audio recordings of just me talking about nothing. <laughs> uh, we also have outtakes and extras from our other shows, like, so this is basically an epithet erased if you want to check that out. Uh, let us know in the comments below if there are any other franchises you would like to see us take a crack at, or maybe, like, let's make a blank movie. Just installations of things. That could be fun. Okay, bye!